you are ready, I confess, I have a lot to say this morning. Um, I'm bringing a little bit, but I know you guys are on that. Matthew chapter 5, we've been going through Matthew chapter 5, and um, we talked last week, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 25, and we talked about uh, our, our offenses. If we know that we have offended somebody, or we know that somebody else has a problem against us, God and, and Jesus, they, they encourage us that obedience is better than our sacrifice, is better than our offering. And I encourage you guys through Romans chapter 12 that, that every moment of our lives is worship to the Lord. So what does that mean? Man, we should be quick. And that's what it says in verse 26, that we should be quick uh, to come to terms quickly with our accuser. And so I want to encourage uh, continue to encourage us that we would heed the words of Jesus, that we should come quickly to those who have ought against us, we should come quickly to those who we are angry with, and we should find forgiveness, and we should make efforts to reconcile our relationships, because God is a God of relationship, He exists in relationship, and He creates in relationship, and He maintains His laws uh, sorry, his laws are created to maintain relationship. Today, I get to tackle a hard subject. I was looking through the Sermon on the Mount, and with all honesty, when I, when I picked the Sermon on the Mount, I knew some of these subjects were coming, and I knew they would be difficult to talk about. They may be a little bit sensitive, but I want to talk about them in a pastoral way today. I want to be considerate of the way that some of these topics over the next couple weeks, we're going to be talking about lust, we're going to be talking about divorce on um, multiple different levels, we're going to be talking about marriage, uh, we're going to talk about sexual sins, we're going to be talking about all sorts of different things. As a pastor, I want to address these things because I know, I am convinced that Jesus wants to bring freedom and wants to bring healing to every area of our lives. And so the way that I uh, address these this morning is knowing this and being aware of this, that there are two different voices that you can hear this morning. There's actually multiple different voices you can hear this morning as I bring up topics, as I touch on different subjects. But I believe, one, that the Holy Spirit's voice will always bring conviction. And as we've been going through this Sermon on the Mount, I've spoken about that conviction. And that as believers, we should enjoy the conviction of God. When we hear God's voice, it, it should be something that makes us glad. And I know his conviction, sometimes the word of God says that it, it, it goes to the deepest part of who we are. So I know it sometimes is uncomfortable. So when I'm speaking today or I'm speaking over the next couple weeks, I want to be aware that some of the topics and some of the things that I mentioned may make people uncomfortable. It may get really personal. But I want you, with everything within you, even in this moment, make a decision that when I hear the conviction of the Holy Spirit, it's going to be a good thing. The other thing that you can hear through, uh, through these messages is condemnation. But I want you to know that the condemnation you hear, when, the, when you hear a voice that says, oh, you're no good, or oh, you're stuck in that road, oh, look, you made that mistake, I want you to know that that is not the voice of God, that that is the voice of the enemy, and I want you to reject any feeling of condemnation. Any feeling of shame, any feeling of uh, uh, I'm no good, any feeling that, oh, it's, I have no, there's no hope for me, I want you to reject those things because those are not from God. But God's Holy Spirit, He brings conviction and He leads us to life. So as I tackle this subject, I want to, I want to pray. We're going to be looking today at Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 through 30. And I want to pray that, 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 the, that you will accept, that you will receive, that you would rejoice in the conviction, the voice of God, and that you would reject, that we corporately, as a body of Christ, we would reject the condemnation, the things that the enemy is trying to say to us, we would reject them, we would receive them. So can we pray that way this morning? Father, I am grateful for your word. God, we rejoice in the fact that you are alive and you speak today. So, Father, I pray that we, as a, your body, would receive from you conviction. We would receive from you your word. But, God, that we would corporately reject the condemnation of the enemy. 
And God, we know that as we hear your voice, you desire a life for us, you desire better for us. So God, I pray in the name of Jesus, we would receive from you, we would reject the enemy. In your name, Jesus. Amen. I remember when I was 13 years old and the first, uh, one, one of the early times that I got to go and spend the night at my friend's house. As a 13 year old boy, we go to celebrate birthday parties and you know what, it was all about games. I, I, it was PS1 back then. Yesterday I went over to our neighbor's house and there were uh, a little boy across the hall, they were playing on the Xbox 360 and they were playing Fortnite. And I was like, wow, this like brings me back to my childhood memories. But as a 13-year-old boy in a house full of, of boys playing video games, not too long, I remember not too long after mom and dad had gone to bed and, and we were there playing video games, that out came a magazine that I was never meant to see. And those images, the images that I, that I saw that evening, they were seared in my mind, and now even two decades later, I can still remember that very moment, exactly what I saw, all the different people that were in the room, and, and, the, and the darkness that crept at that moment. And my story, I know, is not unique. It may, be, it may be have been repeated many times in this room. You can remember the moment that you saw images that your mind at that time were never meant to withhold. Today, this image-driven society has become a $97 billion industry. Stats would say that 90% of boys and 60% of girls have been exposed to pornographic images by the time they're 18. So when I talk about this next generation, and I, and I talk about the, the kids that are sitting up on the stage every Sunday, and I say, wow, I want to I be a church that just like Jesus, that let the ch little children come to me, because I know there are things in this world that they can be introduced to, that I want them to have a solid foundation in Christ so when they're faced with the, the evils of this world, when they're faced with the traps of this enemy, that they are well prepared, that they are well grounded in Christ so that the things of this world do not overcome them because by the time they're 18, over half of them would have been introduced to images they should never see. This industry that I'm talking about, this pornographic in industry, it attracts, the internet attracts more, uh, more than Amazon, Netflix, and Twitter combined. I know Twitter isn't really popular that much anymore, but all of the, all of the people that visit Amazon, Netflix, and Twitter, if you combine all that number, there's more visiting pornographic sites on the internet than those sites alone. So the questions that we have to deal with and that we have to wrestle with as a society, as individuals, as followers of Christ, why? Why is this such a draw? Why is this such a trap? Why is this so enticing to us? And last week, I introduced the idea that God, He exists in relationship. He created in, in relationship. And all of His laws, they are there to sustain relationship. God designed us for intimate relationship to be known by one another. And unfortunately, the enemy uses these designs, these God-given desires, to be twisted and perverted. In Genesis chapter 1, how do I know, Pastor, that we were designed this way? Is this is a good thing. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, Adam and Eve, they were naked and they were unashamed. When God uh, sorry, and we, we will see today when God given desires for intimacy with others get distorted, we turn them on ourselves and use them for self gratification. So, why is these images, why is pornography, why is today modern dating is now you can find a date or you can find an int intimate encounter just the a swipe left or a swipe, a swipe right? Uh, this is all from a design from God. It's a good thing, a design that we would be man and woman married together in an in, in, in intimate relationship. But the enemy's greatest tactic is always to turn what God has meant for good and turn it into evil. What had happened? 
in society, what has happened inside of us when lust takes control, when we find ourselves down this path of receiving images and looking places where we were never intended to look. We have turned love into lust, and we have turned people into objects for our gratification. And Jesus spoke to this. In a society where this has become the norm, where building relationships have, has gone by the wayside, and now it is all about how instantly, how quickly I can gratify myself and my desires. Remember that as we engage in this passage, as I spoke at the beginning, that Jesus' word is, is inviting us to become more like him and to reject the ways of the world and our fleshly desires. So remember to invite the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but to reject the condemnation of the enemy. Let's read together Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and through 30 this morning. It reads this way. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of the members of your whole body than be thrown into hell. And if your right eye, or sorry, right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go to hell. In Matthew chapter 18, in all, uh, 18 verse 9, Jesus also repeats this same idiom, and he does it in, uh, he says it again in a more positive light. It is better that you enter life with one eye or one hand. Either way, Jesus has some serious words to the first century church, to the religious leaders, to the religious followers of the day, and I believe today, again, it's very relevant to our society, to where we're at, that Jesus would go after adultery and lust in such a way that brings some very violent pictures. I thought to myself, maybe I should bring a meat cleaver here uh, to church. But as I begin to continue to research and study out this passage, man, I believe there is so much that we can receive from Jesus and what he's saying and what it means to cut these things out of our life and how we are to do it. So I hope that you're ready to follow me today as I go through this because I believe Jesus' words are so true to us. As I mentioned, uh, or we mentioned earlier in, in, in this passage, as we went through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes a statement that our, uh, our holiness or our righteousness should exceed that of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, or should exceed that of the religious leaders of that day. The religious leaders of that day were guilty of this. They, they, they knew... You shall not commit adultery. So they could stand before Jesus with confidence and say, Hey, I've never touched that. I, I've never committed that sin. I, I've never done that. They were scotch free. They were ready. They, they had completed the law. But what Jesus does here is he knows that the, that the peak of it is, right, if we're, if we're looking at an iceberg, at the top of it may be the adulterous act, the, 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 the touch, the, the naked together, the, the religious leaders were able to say, hey, I, I never touched her, hey, I was never naked together. Uh, I remember this in high school. I went to, I got an opportunity to go to public high school uh, and, and when I was younger, I was homeschooled, I went to Christian school, all that kind of stuff. And when I went to high school, my nickname quickly became Preach. And so uh, I was Preach, hey Preach, can you pray for me? Hey Preach, do you know about this? Hey Preach. And so it was in my 11th grade year, my junior year of high school, and I decided 
I already knew I was going to go to uh, Bible college. I, I already knew what was, was happening in the future. I didn't want to take any honor classes anymore. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go to the regular English classes here, the regular science classes here, and just kind of like like chill out. My uh, uh, my grades were okay. I mean, yeah, I was a, I was a great student. So like, and it was just like. Hey, I, I don't want to have to apply myself. So anyway, I was in the English class, though, and, and I remember the day where the girl sitting behind me tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Hey, preach, I've got a question for you. I didn't know what it was going to be. But in that, in that moment, she goes, Pastor, my, my mom, my grandma, she always takes me to church on Sundays, and she's telling me recently, she was like, hey, uh, that, that, you know, I shouldn't have sex before I'm married, and she goes, Andrew, I, I really got to know this, I to preach, I really got to know this, uh, is oral sex considered sex? Like, is that still okay? I didn't, just like the religious leader, I, I didn't commit adultery, I didn't go all the way, I didn't like, like, Where's the measure at? And Jesus here speaks to all the stuff below the surface. And that's what lust is about. And that's what Jesus is asking us this morning. Where is our desires? Do not commit adultery. It's just the surface. That's just, that's just the outward manifestation of what Jesus knows and Jesus is aware of is going on inside of us. Jesus says what lies within, it matters. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. Everything you do flows from within you. Jesus is getting after our, oops, that wasn't me. That isn't what I normally do. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's exactly you. It's in your heart. I talked about last week. We're made up of our, 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 our will. Sorry, our, our, our soul, mind, and, and body. And, and our, our soul is made up of our will and our desires. And our emotions. Our desires are part of who we are. Matthew 15, verse 19, Jesus says it this way, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false uh, testimony, and slander. Jesus is saying here, when he talks in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 through 30, he says, no, it's not just what you have done. It's not just what you have touched. It is your heart. It is your desires. Let me be for sure here. Jesus is not saying that sexuality is bad. For the married people in the, in the room, that that is the right context of a husband and wife relationship. And in the Bible, it's even encouraged. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35, this is for all the married folk. Have sex and, and don't withhold it from each other, only so that you can seek God more. This is a design by God for a man and a woman to enjoy in a committed relationship one to another. As I used to give this advice to, to single people. I would say, you know, don't, and I remember receiving this, I, I grew up in the church myself, and high school people would say, you know, don't have sex uh, before you're married because it will be better when you get married. And then I learned, no, it's not any better when you get married. It still takes practice. You still have to get used to it. But what it does speak to in our singleness and our willingness to stay pure, it does speak the gospel as you live celibate, here until your marriage. Why? Because Jesus stayed faithful to us. He's waiting on us. He's not giving up on us. Like we read in Psalms multiple times, his steadfast love, it endures forever. He's never changing. He is for us. He's waiting on us. 
2,000 years later, he hasn't got a different bride. He's not going after a different way. No, he's faithfully waiting for us. And as we live our life in purity in our singleness, we speak the gospel over and over again that just as Christ is waiting for you, I am waiting for that moment in that time in the right way in holiness. What Jesus is also not saying is that temptation is sin. In James chapter 1, verse 14 through 15, it is described this way. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires. Desires gone the wrong way. Desires that God has given you. Gifts that God has given you. and They've gone the wrong way and they have enticed you. Then, after desires have been conceived, it gives birth to sin. Temptation is not the sin. But I believe it should be a red flag that our desires may not match up with God's. If I'm tempted to lust after, if I'm tempted to behold longer than I should, if I'm tempted to go up a certain way, I should, I should be aware, I should become aware that maybe my desires have been twisted and they're not what God has planned. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, Jesus was tempted in every way, but he did not sin. I mean, Jesus had desires differently than God, Andrew. In the middle of the garden, he knew what was about to happen. And did he not come before God and say, Oh, if you could take this cup and let it pass, but no, not my will, but your will. Not my desire, but your desire. Jesus lived the perfect, submitted life to the Father, and he encourages us in the same way. Your temptation is not a sin, but they should make you aware. They should be a red flag to you. They should be a warning to you. Maybe your desires do not match up with the Father's desires for your life. So we look back here in Matthew chapter 5. I want to ask the question, what is Jesus saying by using the word lust? The ESV version, of, I, I know I, I often read from ESV, and it says this, that anyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. When you think about the Greek, I've said this before, there's multiple fun fun terms, and, they, and in our English language, maybe it's really limited in what it means to look, and, and it's not just to see. We don't need to, I didn't also, I didn't, I didn't bring meat cleavers, and I didn't bring blinders, you know, so we just you know, walk around with our guiding sticks our, the rest of our life. But to look with intent, to survey, to break down in the Greek, it says to focus with passionate desire or to trace with your eyes. Imagination is a beautiful gift from God. Man, it sent man to the moon. Man, there's all sorts of creations. I'm about to, I'm about to have surgery on, uh, on Tuesday for my knee, and they're going to take these little robotic arms and stick them in and fix, and fix my meniscus. I mean, God gave us the ability to think beyond, and, and it's amazing. But our God-given imagination can also take us to very bad places. Both adultery and lust, they come from the same place. A lingered look, a desire, a tracing, a focus on, a passionate desire. And both come from the same place of an unhealthy heart that turns love into lust and human beings into objects for gratification. 
We have to be careful for this in the way that I, I speak to singles about their expectations for marriage. As many times I, I, I talk with, with singles, and I was a college minister for a while, and they had their eyes fixed on this man or this woman that was going to meet all of their needs. And I, I can't wait. I love them because this about them, and I love them because this about them, and this is going to meet my needs. It's going to be so good. We're such a perfect fit together, Andrew. It's awesome. And it was sad to see so many times where they exchanged what God desired to give them in himself with that of another person because they are still thought they were in love, but they were really going after somebody to meet their own needs. Amen. In marriage life, I give the same warning to each other that we have to be careful and conscious of how we are seeking after our spouse to meet our needs when Christ himself is the one that will meet and satisfy all our needs. And once we have our needs met by him, we're going to get into this in our marriage series uh, in a couple weeks, but once we have our needs met by him, and then we're able to serve one another in love. What is love? Love is not self-seeking. Love thinks about the other's interest at our greatest expense. That's right. You see how the enemy has twisted this in some of our minds and in our society? Love sacrificed for others. We have turned it into lust, into self-gratification. We see this as the porn industry continues to grow, as our modern day dating apps turn love into lust, we're reminded this morning of love's description in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, some people refer to it as a love chapter, but this is how it describes love. Love is patient, so it's not immediate. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It isn't proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Love, it keeps no wrong, a record of wrongs. Love, it does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. We're going to get back to that truth in a little bit. When we think about how we are to cut these things out of our lives, it's about truth. It always love, always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love is always going towards the other. It's thinking about the other first. Lust says me, 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 and love says you, you, you. So what is Jesus' solution to our lust problem? We read this. Verse 29. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. See, everybody has two eyes this morning, I think. For it's better than that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose your members than to lose your whole body in hell. So why did I bring meat cleavers? Why didn't I set up a station outside for dissection purposes? Believe as we examine scripture a little bit more this morning, we're going to see how Jesus and how scripture reveals to us the way that we can cut out our ungodly desires. So first scripture this morning, we're going to go through a few of them, but Romans chapter 8, verse 13. How are we, pastor, then going to cut off these desires? How are we going to get lust out of our lives. Romans chapter 8 verse 13, it says this, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you continue on in your lust, if you continue on in your sin, if you continue on in the way of the world, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So here we begin to see instructions on how we are going to 
cut off or how we're going to die to or how we're going to get rid of lust. And it says this, by the Spirit, we're able to put to death. We're able to kill. We're able to cut off the, the deeds of the flesh. Flesh is, it's a nice churchy word, but uh, the way that we use it in the, the scripture, I don't think I, I don't think I could go you know, down to the, the bar downtown and, and learn what flesh meant, and it would match up with what we see in the Bible. But flesh in, in the Bible is any desire distorted to not honoring God. So it's the way of our life. It's the way that, uh, that we, we, we have desires that are distorted and they don't honor God. They usually, that is what we refer to as the flesh, the way of the flesh. It's a, it's a desire, it's an act that is distorted to not honor God. Well, let's look further. As we see here, uh, it's by the Spirit that we cut, cut off these things, that we cut out these things. And so the Bible reveals to us what the Spirit of God is, what the Spirit is for us as believers, as followers of Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, so if we meet in chapter 6, uh, around verse 17, it begins to, to share with us the armor that we have, the protection that we have against the enemy. It talks about the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith. But it mentions this about the spirit, the sword of the spirit, the offensive weapon, the, the meat cleaver. What is the meat cleaver of God? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. How are we to cut these things out of our lives? It's by the Spirit. What is the Spirit that we have within us? What is the power that Jesus introduced? The Spirit, the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit that was to come. He says He was going to lead us and guide us into all truth. He was going to convict us, like I said at the beginning, of unrighteousness, right? And, and, and so the Spirit is the Word of God, which is the truth of God, which is the light. Last week I introduced the thought that from Romans chapter 12 that all of our life is worship. And if we follow that, we know that we are to renew our minds. How do we renew our minds? How do we think differently about the world around us? How do we think differently about the passions and the desires and the ways of the world that we have? How do we do it? It is by the word. We cut out desires. We cut out our flesh by the word. The Word of God works to cut out desires, lust, and it brings truth to our hearts. Because the problem when we find ourselves in sin, when we find ourselves that it's okay with the lustful desire that I have, when we find ourselves in this place, the problem is that we are deceited, we are full of deceit, we are, we, we are blinded by the way of the world, we're blinded by the enemy to know that every that, that, to know that it's wrong, so we are convinced we are dis, uh, we are full of deceit. We are convinced that it's okay, the lustful desires that I carry. And some of us in the room have become way too comfortable with our desires being contrary to what God wants. Ephesians chapter four, verse twenty-two. Let's continue on this path. To finding how our desires are mixed with uh, our own flesh. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, you were taught with regards to your former way to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. So our desires that are contrary to what God wants for us. They're deceitful. They convince us that everything's okay. They convince us, hey, we're only human. Hey, I'm only a male. Hey, I'm only a female. These are just things that I struggle with. It's okay. These things are de have deceived us into thinking that they are the way that we should go. And how do we overcome deceit? If someone is de deceived into thinking something is okay, if someone is deceived into thinking uh, that, that this way of life or, or this gimmick or that thing is true, what do we do? We share with them the truth. But hey, you're, you're deceived. Sorry, you're, you're wrong. Hey, this is leading your life astray. We say, oh, let me share with you the truth. Let me give you some facts. Let me show you this article. Well, here as a, in Scripture, it says, we reveal to them, the Word of God reveals to them the truth by the Spirit. 
In 1 Peter 1.14, it says this. It doesn't even call it deceit. It calls it ignorance. That we were once led by the passion of our former ignorance. The Word of God, the Spirit of God by His sword, the Word of God, it kills ignorance. And it reveals to us the glory and the beauty and the honor of the holiness in which God designed us to live. Romans 10, verse 17. Remember, that as the truth comes to us, we still have the opportunity to receive it or reject it. So my encouragement this morning is not just that the Word of God, so we're reading the Word of God, right? It's truth to us. The Scripture also says it's like a mirror. It shows us what's wrong with it. But then the step next is to have faith in it, to believe on the truth. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith. Believe in God's design for your desires, right? We're talking specifically about love, so we're talking specifically about sexuality. So faith, belief in God's design for your desires, right? Belief in God's way, belief in God's truth, come from hearing. So you say, hey, Aunt, uh, Pastor, Andrew, hey, I still have a, a problem with desires. I, I still, they're still like work on me. How do, how do I believe that God's way is better than the way that I've been living? How do you do that? It comes by hearing, and hearing through the Word of God. So, it, in fact, I have to ask God for grace. God, fill me with grace. God, I pray that you would fill me with belief, fill me with faith to believe that your way is better than my ways. Your ways, your truth are better than what I thought was the right way. We want to stop the thirst. We have to come to Jesus. It was sad last week. Rachel and I had an opportunity to go on a date. And so I said, hey, would you like to go down to the Union and watch the sunset? It was really gorgeous. But last week, all the, uh, the campus is not in session, but many of the students have returned. And it was a sad sight to see groups of young women and young men running to the bars, and it was only 6.30 in the evening. They're thirsty, they're, they're searching after things, they're trying to get satisfaction, they, they're, they're hungry for it, they're thirsty for it, and they trying to find the thing that's going to fill their void. But the truth of the Word of God is that the only thing that will satisfy your lust, the only thing that will satisfy your desires is Him and Him alone. John 6, 35 says this, Whoever comes to Jesus, they shall not be hungry. Whoever believes shall not be thirsty. How do you end your thirst? How do you end your desire for the things that don't line up with God's word? You come to him over and over again. You come to his word. You seek his presence. You worship him. You focus on him. You fill your life with him. You get rid of what you watch. You get rid of what you're listening to. You get rid of all these things and you focus Focus on Him, and He will satisfy you guys. He will satisfy you. He will satisfy the deepest part of who you are. And it will be so much better than any filth the world has to offer. Mm -hmm. Lustful desires, they promise satisfaction. But if you follow them, they will only lead you to a mirage leaving you more thirsty from the journey you had to get there. God promises to us satisfaction from our thirst. Moses overcame the passions of his lustful desires in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 24 to 26 it's recorded by faith Moses chose God 
over the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered reproach. So he went and he, he lived as a slave instead of living in the, in the king's palace. He considered that reproach greater wealth as he looked to the reward that was to come. Pastor, I may have a problem believing that the things of God is better than where I'm at. I pray that the Holy Spirit this morning would convince you that the ways of God fill you with joy, with beauty, with wholeness like you've never experienced before. How do we kill lust? I would propose to you this morning, it's not by cutting off limbs, but it's by believing in Jesus and His promises. By believing on His truth, on His way, on His holiness, as His encouragement to live apart from this world, in this world, but not of this world. That, that we can live free of lustful desires when we put our faith completely in Jesus, that Jesus is more satisfying than any fleeting pleasure. We kill lust by being satisfied with God, His truth, His Word, by His Spirit. So if you find yourself struggling with lust today, Pastor, I'm Deal it. This is real. This is part of who I am. I want to encourage you in this. First, admit your brokenness. As I said at the beginning, I believe, I am totally convinced that God wants freedom and He wants wholeness and He wants healing for every individual in this building, in this church, in this community, I would say in this whole area of Madison. But the first step is saying, Lord, I am broken. Second thing to do, flee sexual immorality. Man, some of you guys have smartphones, you need to get rid of your smartphone and go back to just a flip phone, right? So I mean, some of you, there, there's things on your computer and you're like, you know what, I need to get some kind of software, I need to set something, but I need to flee from it. There's some the places you've been going that you say, you know what, I need, to, I need to get away, I need to go from. How do we resist the enemy? James says we resist the enemy by fleeing. Running the opposite direction. I told somebody recently, whatever you feed is going to grow. Right? So if we flee, if we feed the, the, the things of the flesh, if we feed our desires, it's only going to grow. It's only going to increase. But if we feed our spirit, if we feed ourselves with the things of God, those things, those godly things that we desire in our life, they're going to begin to grow. They're going to flourish and they're going to produce fruit in our life. What we feed grows. So flee sexual immorality. Cultivate healthy intimacy. Man, our singles, I'm just so encouraged by our, our church body that as a whole, man, we, we, are, we are in relationship with one another. I want to encourage and continue to build relationship, healthy relationship with one another. Married couples, hey, I said that earlier. Sex is a gift from God. Don't withhold it from each other. Encourage it. Go for it. Feed, and then the last thing we should do, hey, we should, uh, we should admit our brokenness, leave sexual immorality, cultivate healthy relationship where people know us, can speak into our lives, where it's more than, more than just a hello, how you doing, we can speak to each other, and then fourth, feed on the Word of God. Feed on the Word of God. Let this become, like Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Let this become your regular food, your intake on a regular basis. Lord, speak to me. Value His Word above all else. Have faith in it. Put it into practice. Help, hey, get some, uh, some people in your missional community or in the church to say, hey, can we memorize Scripture together? Can we help us become, let this become part of who we are? We've got to get to work cutting off the deeds of the flesh, cutting off our lustful desires, because if, the, the, sorry, 
not if, the words of Jesus this morning are true to us. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And this morning, God wants to begin a surgery on our life, reworking us, rewiring our desires so that our desires again come in line with his word and who he is. How do I end the message? One, I want to say, if you're in this room and you say, Pastor, I have, I am dealing with lust. I have some things. Hey, I need to talk with you. If if you are a lady in this room, you say, Hey, I feel comfortable. If you and Rachel, I can talk to you and Rachel. Hey, we can make up some some appointments this week. I want to be laid out, so I won't be I won't be working, but I have lots of time on my hands. So. Um, I want to meet with you. I want to walk with you. As your pastors, we want to see freedom. We want to see wholeness in your life. Whether you're married or you're single, it doesn't matter. If you're dealing with this issue, I would love to walk with you. But second thing this morning, I believe God wants to give you freedom this morning. And so I want to take a moment to pray and to respond in prayer and say, Yes, God, that's me. Jesus, you put a finger right on my heart. That's me, admitted to him. And the word of God says that, again, I, I repeat this a lot in our, in our time of prayer, but God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the power. That gives me hope that when I admit to God my fault, he gives grace to me. He lifts me up. He works with me. He, he's on my behalf. He works toward me. He works to renew me. But when I'm proud, when I resist him, when I do my own thing, when I say, God, I got this, he resists me. And so this morning, the opportunity is to come before God. And these altars, I want to be up here to pray. If you say, Pastor, I want you to pray with me, I'll pray with you. But I want to encourage you to make this a place of prayer so that we can go before God and say, God, yes, I'm broken. Yes, I need you. Come and fill me and make me whole. Amen. Can we pray that way today? Let me pray over you, and then we'll respond this morning. Father, I am grateful for your word. God, we love your Holy Spirit that brings us conviction, that shows us where we're not quite like you, God. And Father, this morning is a topic that, that is uh, probably possible that many of us are dealing with. And so, Lord, I pray for courage this morning to respond in faith to come before you and to admit our faults, to admit ways that our lust has driven our life. And I pray, Jesus, that everyone that responds this morning would find grace. They would find healing. They would find wholeness. And as together, as a church, as we walk this out, I pray that your word would come to bear on us. It would cut out anything that is not of you and would spring forth life and fruit that is according to your word. God, I pray now that as we respond, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus against the enemy that would bring condemnation, but God, that we would respond to you in boldness and receive from you all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.